Hi, nice, nice to meet you, and uh, very, I'm very excited to present you all the lessons, all the interesting stuff that we learned. Uh, the past uh, few years, we have developed uh, different drivers, especially uh, the Rust driver and uh, different ways that we actually use Rust uh, in CELADB. Uh, before I start, uh, there's a very short uh, poll. Uh, I think it just pop up for you. Uh, so the question uh, that we are asking you is, uh, uh, where are you in your NoSQL adoption? We would like to know you a little better and uh, uh, to gauge how uh, how the uh, different databases and uh, different uh, storage solutions uh, fare uh, in our audience. So uh, it would be great uh, if you uh, filled out poll. And now let's jump uh, back into the presentation. So a few words about me. Uh, I'm Piotr Grabowski, a software team leader at CELADB, and my team is responsible for different drivers uh, that you can use to connect to CELADB database, uh, as well as different connectors, such as Kafka connector uh, that you can use to uh, write data into Kafka or read data from Kafka back into CELADB. And I've been at CELADB for almost three years uh, now. So a few words about CELADB, and uh, our database is really great for uh, massive data-intensive applications uh, that require high throughput, as well as uh, low latencies. Uh, I think this, is, uh, this isn't talked about uh, that much, but uh, having low latencies uh, makes sure that your clients have a better experience of using the products, and you can use the database in more advanced ways. Uh, knowing that the queries uh, will uh, finish in a short uh, time. Uh, we have designed CELADB with uh, uh, performance and close to the metal approach uh, right from the beginning. So for example, uh, CELA is written in C++ using our own sister framework for writing asynchronous applications. And that means we don't have to wait for, for example, Java's uh, garbage collection. And we, when we compare the performance uh, to uh, Cassandra, which we are compatible with, uh, we have uh, five times higher throughput and even better on some workloads. You have much lower latencies. And this is a great difference when you compare a five millisecond latency to a 100 millisecond latency. And this really opens the door for uh, some new class of applications. And when you combine those aspects, the, uh, the cost of using CELADB uh, is much less compared to different solutions. So, uh, so we can either save money or store more data in your database for the same cost. As I said, we are compatible with Apache Cassandra. This was the, the first premise of our database. But uh, in the past years, uh, we have uh, actually started being compatible with DynamoDB and also developing our own new features on top of that, uh, both those two APIs. And we have a very, uh, very diverse uh, uh, solutions you can use uh, CELADB in. So for example, you can use uh, CELADB as a cloud offering on our CELADB cloud. You can use our enterprise version of CELADB, which is great for really large databases. And of course, uh, you can use the open source solution uh, for free, and it also works great. So a few words uh, why I'm presenting in front of uh, Linux Foundation. So CELADB uh, runs only on Linux. Uh, and we actually take uh, much, uh, 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 we take uh, advantage of uh, very uh, different Linux only APIs such as IO Uring and previously we use Apple IO interfaces and this allows us to really perform a high, uh, high throughput and low latency IO and uh, a fun fact is that our co-founder of CELADB and current CTO 
actually began the development of a kernel virtual machine in Linux kernel, Avikiviti. Uh, so we have a long history uh, with Linux and uh, while developing uh, SciladB, we also keep in touch with uh, kernel developers. Developers, For example, when we are developing the IOU ring uh, backend for CSTAR, uh, we actually went uh, into contact with uh, different developers of that uh, IO ring backend and uh, the libraries you can use to uh, talk with IO ring and we actually through this collaboration we made the uh, this uh, library uh, faster uh, many companies use SilaDB. this is just uh, a couple of them and uh, those are the one the biggest uh, that we have uh, so as you can see there this is a very diverse group from disney plus hotstar uh, providing streaming services uh, discord providing a really great chat experience as well as for example epic games uh, a game developer so let's jump into the, the main portion of the presentation and go into our uh, office, office at Poland. So let's zoom in into Warsaw and go into the the office I'm sitting in right now, which uh, hosts the uh, the drivers team that is responsible for developing the Rust driver. So today, uh, first of all, I'll talk about uh, a few uh, facts about drivers, what they are, and uh, uh, what is their purpose and how you can uh, optimize their performance. Next, we'll focus on the SciladB Rust driver and different uh, stories uh, uh, and different optimization paths that we took. And uh, we'll uh, finish the presentation with uh, a very interesting uh, way that we use Rust uh, in conjunction with our other languages uh, by building bindings uh, from other languages like C++ into the core of SciladB Rust driver. So in this presentation, by drivers, I mean the libraries that allow you to send queries to SciladB and uh, allow you to do it efficiently and uh, very easily. So the primary protocol that we use in drivers is CQL. Uh, actually, this protocol is inherited from Cassandra, so you can use this protocol to clock uh, with both Cassandra and SciladB. Uh, this protocol is based on TCP. Uh, we at SciladB support the, the fourth version of the protocol, and this uh, protocol is based on different frames. Uh, in those frames, you have uh, different messages, for example, a message that initiates the connection, uh, when you connect to the database or the message that actually executes a, a, a query. And uh, within those frames, you can have multiple uh, simultaneous streams of requests. So you can send multiple requests and wait uh, for many concurrent requests. And we support also compression. Uh, this uh, protocol supports compression. Uh, SciladB drivers compared to other drivers to Apache Cassandra uh, support shard awareness. And uh, this is a way to connect to directly to a specific shard. And by shard, uh, this means a core in SciladB, and this greatly improves the performance. So a few uh, words about the role of the drivers, uh, because you might think that uh, maybe this other a layer of abstraction might not really be needed. So the, the drivers uh, really do a lot of stuff behind the scenes. So first of all, they serialize and deserialize the, the protocol and uh, different parts of the protocol. So for example, uh, the, the SQL frames that I talked about, the, the query frame, the initialization of the connection, uh, as well as uh, the serialization and the serialization of different types that you actually send over the network. So SciladB supports uh, different types, 
you can of course send uh, very basic types such as uh, ints, strings, and so on. Uh, but uh, when you look at those more advanced types like dates, uh, different user defined types, uh, the serialization is much uh, harder to do it on your own. Uh, the driver also maintains the metadata about the cluster. So what tables are available, what nodes are available. And this uh, information is very crucial to send the query to a correct node. And in terms of SillaDB, also to a correct shard. So the actual physical core that is uh, containing this data. Uh, of course, the driver actually sends the data over the network. And the different drivers like GoSQL driver, the Java driver, have uh, many uh, helpers that allow you to very conveniently uh, construct the query. So when you think of the driver, uh, it might not be obvious at the first sight how the driver could actually improve performance, but uh, on top of the uh, list, there, there are a few optimizations that we uh, employ in our drivers. So first of all is the shared awareness. So sending the query actually to a correct node, to a correct uh, physical core of that node. And that means that uh, SillaDB doesn't have to route internally the, the query to a different core. And this could be very uh, expensive when you have, for example, a computer with uh, and CPU with different NUMA nodes and to actually copy uh, the data between those NUMA nodes, which can be uh, more uh, expensive. Uh, some features like Scylla change data capture, change the partitioning scheme that we use to uh, determine which uh, part of the data is stored on which node. And uh, this, is, uh, this has to be implemented in the driver to do this uh, calculation correctly. Uh, SillaDB also supports low uh, uh, different transactions uh, schemes like LWT. Uh, so uh, when you send uh, this uh, transaction, uh, you need to query it to a correct node to avoid potentially uh, different uh, Paxos conflicts that uh, could happen if you just send it randomly to different nodes. And uh, the final technique that we employ in our drivers to make them uh, performant is to really optimize uh, the performance in hot paths of the driver. So those uh, paths that are actually taken when uh, making a query. So serialization, deserialization is really an expensive part of making a query to have it in the correct format, to not uh, copy the data uh, multiple times. The routing code is another aspect of the driver that uh, actually takes a lot of time to calculate the hash of the of the data and to de determine on that hash to get the data routed to a correct node. And uh, when optimizing the driver, we need to avoid uh, making any copies of the data that are not necessary, uh, allocations, which uh, actually can take a lot of time, and logs. So let's start with Scylla DB Rust driver. So the idea for the driver was actually born during a hackathon a uh, few years ago. And of course, after the hackathon, we actually continued the development to make it into a real product that uh, people can use in production. So uh, here's a block that we uh, made after just after the, the hackathon uh, to describe the, uh, the driver. And uh, the driver uses the Tokyo framework uh, for asynchronous operations. Uh, this is a really common uh, framework in Rust. And the driver is now future complete. Uh, so we support many advanced features uh, compared to other drivers such as uh, having the shard awareness functionality, having the asynchronous interface, uh, so you can really send a large number of queries concurrently, uh, different compression schemes, all those CQL types like 
dates, uh, user defined types, collections, and so on, uh, as well as other features. So actually, uh, this might be a really interesting story is that uh, the initial prototype of the driver was uh, developed during the hackathon by only four people and in just a couple of days. But uh, this initial prototype was actually enough to perform some basic queries and send them to, to Scylla. So I think this is a great story on how you can actually uh, do such a complicated uh, project in real short time and uh, have some, uh, by doing that, uh, gain some knowledge and some insight about the performance and actually not to uh, theorize about the, the performance, but just write it in a couple of days and try it, uh, the performance on your own. So after this uh, hackathon, those were the initial benchmarks that we did. So we actually compared the Scylla Rust driver with a Go CQL driver, so the driver for Go, and the existing driver that uh, could be used to talk with Cassandra in the Rust language, the CDRS uh, driver. Uh, so what uh, this table shows is the time it takes to process 10 million requests uh, with some fixed concurrency. As you can see, the, the driver, the Rust driver, is uh, much better compared to those two drivers. And this was uh, really encouraging us to really develop this driver forward and really make it production quality. After some time, we actually uh, did those benchmarks once again with the driver at much more mature state and the performance was still uh, good compared to other drivers. So uh, the blue bar on the left uh, is the Celaras driver and we compared it with CPP driver, uh, different uh, variants of CPP driver as well as GoCQL driver. And this graph shows uh, how much time it took to execute 1 million inserts to SillaDB. And as you can see, the Rust driver was uh, clearly beating all the other drivers. So this is uh, a graph of uh, doing selects. So this might be a bit, uh, uh, a bit more uh, straining on the driver because uh, the driver now has to deserialize uh, the output that it gets from SillaDB and uh, the select can return many rows and those rows have to be allocated somewhere in the driver, deserialized, uh, but when it comes to an insert, uh, there is nothing that is returned by SillaDB when an insert is correct, so uh, the need for deserialization is much lower. But even in that uh, benchmark, the Rust driver was much uh, faster than other drivers. So a few words about the design that we did uh, for the Rust driver. So we decide on the uh, Tokyo runtime. So asynchronous Rust is based on a quite unique future promise model. And uh, by uh, unique, I mean that the future actually holds the data that will be filled in when this computation ends. And uh, running a function that uh, returns the future does not automatically spawn as asynchronous tasks, as is the case in other languages. So actually for Rust, you need to use some runtime. And uh, we chose the Tokyo runtime to, as a base for, for the Rust driver. We uh, also looked at other. Uh, runtimes, but we chose Tokyo as it was the the most uh, popular and the most uh, standard, let's say, uh, runtime compared to different uh, libraries uh, available for asynchronous Rust projects. And uh, having decided on the Tokyo framework, we then moved on to design the API and uh, Starting a new driver from scratch was actually a great way to really rethink the API design uh, because other drivers were developed over the years and they had all 
they had lots of crust uh, that has accumulated over the uh, over the years of the development of the drivers. But uh, with Sila DB Rust driver, we could start fresh and uh, have a new clean API. So, uh, so we designed the API to be very clean, to have sensible defaults, and as you can see, it's very easy to. Uh, perform a query. This particular query selects uh, three columns from a uh, from a table and uh, iterates over them and prints them. And as you can see, uh, we use the different uh, facilities that the Rust uh, language offers us to deserialize it back into native types like i32 and string, so it can be consumed very easily. So now uh, let's move on to some interesting uh, things that we discovered during the development of the driver that impacted the, the performance of the driver. So uh, one day, uh, an issue was raised by the author of Latte, a benchmark tool for Silad and Cassandra. And the author raised an issue that uh, the driver had uh, some problems with scaling with high concurrency of requests. Uh, the driver uh, didn't really perform that well when the concurrency of requests, so how many requests you do simultaneously when this uh, number was very large, the driver didn't really uh, scale as uh, as was as it was supposed to scale. And uh, actually debugging the issue was really fun but uh, challenging. And at the end, we managed to identify the root cause in the implementation of Tokyo's Futures Unordered, a uh, utility to, to gather many futures and wait for them. And uh, this was actually due to cooperative scheduling in Tokyo. So it was possible for this structure to iterate over all futures each time it was polled. And if there were many futures uh, in, that, uh, in that structure, we in the, the runtime had to iterate over them multiple times as, uh, over all of them. And uh, this is clearly a N squared performance issue. And actually, the fix was uh, uh, really nice to just limit the number of uh, futures that are iterated in each poll. And that way, uh, this, future, this fix was merged to Tokyo and uh, this fixed the, the scaling issue of the driver. And we worked with the Tokyo maintainers to, to get this feature fixed. Uh, so now let's move on to maybe something uh, more high level. So when you think of the, the Rust driver, uh, when the driver starts, it uh, makes connections to different nodes, to, uh, to different nodes of SLADB. And actually making multiple connections is really crucial for performance. So by default, the driver uh, makes a connection directly to each core of SILADB. So this is the one connection per shard number. Uh, but you can actually customize it to uh, make uh, more connections. And uh, in some benchmarks that we did, this actually improved the performance. So uh, in terms of Cassandra drivers, they make multiple connections to different nodes. but uh, when it comes to SILADB, we can actually connect to a particular core of the of the node, and this is uh, what SILADB does, and uh, and the SILADB Rust driver does. And this behavior we implemented right from the beginning of the SILADB Rust driver, and uh, this uh, makes it possible to have even better latencies. So uh, before this. Uh, uh, before implementing this, this feature, for example, in other drivers that didn't have this feature, when a query was sent to an incorrect uh, core of the, of the database, the core has to route this connection and this request to a different core. And uh, this can be very expensive, uh, even on the very lowest level of the CPU design, uh, when you have uh, different caches uh, that are uh, particular to uh, uh, some uh, core, 
or you have uh, different NUMA nodes uh, in some server CPUs, uh, having to copy this data between uh, different cores can be very expensive. But the Rust driver and our implementation avoids this cost by directly connecting to the correct core, uh, the correct core. And uh, this, of course, required some changes in both the driver and the database. So, uh, for example, the database uh, has some facilities to uh, to allow you to connect to a particular core. So, apart from connecting to a particular core of the database, uh, uh, one big uh, thing to to keep in mind is that uh, the DB is a multi-node database, and the data is partitioned across the no multiple nodes, and uh, the uh, the algorithm, the structure that we use to do it is a vNode configuration. So the data is uh, put on this uh, virtual uh, ring, uh, which is uh, presented on the slide. And we partition this, uh, this ring into smaller chunks. Those are called vNodes. And uh, different nodes have uh, a portion of the data uh, from some vNodes. Some, some node can have some subset of the V nodes. And the role of the driver is to actually figure out that uh, if you make a select query on an insert query, which V node it will land to and which uh, node does it correspond to. So this is how it looks like. Uh, when there's a select query or an insert query that touches some partition key, we hash this partition key. This is actually done by the driver. And uh, by calculating this hash and uh, having uh, keeping in mind the, uh, the ring structure that we fed from Scylla, we can determine which node the, the query should land to. Uh, recently, this year, we did a refactor of this subsystem. So uh, in this refactor, we really focus on improving the, the performance of the load balancing phase of the driver. Uh, before making this change, we actually benchmarked uh, the driver and pre-profiled it very carefully. And the load balancing phase of the driver was actually a very considerable chunk of the driver execution time. And uh, by doing the refactor, reduce the number of allocations and atomic operations. So this can be operations related to mutexes while binding the query plan. And we did a very interesting design of this uh, load balancing refactor. So we uh, split the, the algorithm into two phases. There's a peak phase, which is the, the common case. Uh, this is the phase that assumes that uh, the first node that you send the query to, that this query will succeed on that node. And there's this also this fallback phase, which uh, means that the, the query didn't succeed on the first node. For example, the network was flaky and uh, the connection timed out. And this fallback is a way to determine which next node to send the query to. And uh, by splitting those two cases into the the hot path, the peak path, and the cold path, the fallback path, we were able to better optimize the, the common case, the peak phase. And uh, this is the, the phase where only a single node from the load balancing plan is actually needed. Uh, we also did some pre-computation of the replica sets. And uh, as you saw in the previous slides, we have this, we have this token ring. And actually, when you calculate the hash, you need to uh, scan this ring and to determine which, uh, uh, which vNode is actually holding the data uh, by pre-computating -pre a phase uh, uh, a subset of this, uh, uh, of, of this phase. We are able to optimize the performance and have constant time access to, uh, to the pre-computated replica uh, slices uh, that are used for load balancing. So this is a quick comparison of uh, 
how the performance was improved and how we did it. So uh, this is a short summary of uh, different uh, number of allocations, reallocations that we do during an insert. So as you can see before the insert, we had to do uh, on average 15 allocations per request uh, and even allocating around two kilobytes of data uh, for making this uh, request. Uh, but after the optimization phase, after we implement, implemented this new uh, refactored load balancing, we are able to improve the performance and have the number of allocations really uh, lo lower. So this is nine fewer allocations. So this is 60% uh, less allocations. And even a greater number is that uh, we are able to make the allocated space really uh, smaller. So now it's only 300 bytes allocated per request. And as you can uh, remember, uh, in terms of Scylla, we do potentially millions of requests per second. So all those bytes add up very quickly. Uh, this is a similar data form for selects. In case of selects, the, the gain is uh, a bit lower because in case of selects, we need to allocate some data, some buffers for keeping the data that we receive from Scylla. So uh, in that case, uh, we still need to do a lot of allocations to uh, get this data into correct buffers, deserialize it, but still, this was a great improvement. So this is a short overview of other efforts that we uh, have made or are still making in CLDB Rust driver to improve the performance. Uh, one is actually a bit uh, different compared to those uh, previous optimizations. So this is actually an optimization, not of uh, actually a raw throughput, but uh, mostly focusing on the cost of uh, using uh, the driver. So uh, many deployments of our clients run CLADB on different uh, availability zones of, for example, AWS Cloud, but uh, doing so uh, can bring uh, costs up because uh, sending the data between the availability zones is, uh, can be costly. So by introducing rack aware load balancing, uh, by rack, uh, I mean, in this case, the availability zone of AWS, we are able to send the query directly within the, the availability zone. And this uh, greatly reduces the cost to make a query. And actually, because the, the, uh, the time to send the query is uh, lower uh, within availability zone, uh, this actually even reduces the latency uh, by doing uh, uh, by querying the, the newest nodes in the cluster. And the second one is uh, uh, the rewrite that we did uh, with uh, the serialization. So uh, as you can remember, when the Scylla DB database sends uh, the uh, results of the query, so for example, you uh, send a select query, and the database sends you a list of rows. The previous implementation had to deserialize each row into a vector of columns and then a vector of vectors of columns. So this is the vector of rows. And as you can see, this, is, this will mean that for each row, you have to do an allocation of this VEC and this can be quite costly. So an obvious but uh, more uh, 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 harder to implement approach that we did uh, is to allow you to deserialize on fly. So that means you, you don't have to materialize this vector uh, before reading the data. You can just uh, deserialize and consume the data uh, as it's deserialized. So that means that we don't have to allocate this big vector each time you read the, the results of the query. And uh, implementing this, uh, this approach actually 
uh, the Rust lifetimes functionality uh, made it really great to implement it this on the fly this realization in a memory safe way. So a few few words about uh, this particular approach that we did. So uh, we marked the old API as legacy as the deserialization is actually a very uh, common uh, common operation that the users do with uh, with the drivers. So we didn't want to uh, really break their uh, workloads. So we marked the old API as legacy for backwards compatibility. And uh, we introduced the new API that uh, has the on-demand deserialization and uh, uh, that means that we have reduced allocations and uh, the migration path is really easy. Uh, this, uh, this particular one wasn't uh, started by us. It was a community started project by uh, Joseph Perez. And this is his uh, GitHub handle. So uh, he actually uh, was really interested in uh, making uh, a driver that would have no uh, allocations at all uh, as uh, hard as this task may seem he actually uh, made a really great prototype uh, that allows you to do queries with Scylla with uh, uh, zero copy deserialization and actually zero allocations per request uh, maybe one allocation in some corner cases uh, so he actually did the query plan caching, maybe a very similar approach that we did with the uh, with the load balancing uh, refactor. And uh, his driver can do zero or only one allocation per request. And uh, we are actually looking into incorporating the ideas shown in that project into the Scylla DB Rust driver. And uh, this is uh, this. Frankly speaking, was a really uh, interesting surprise for us, uh, as we didn't know about this project before. Uh, but uh, this was a really nice motivation for us to improve the driver even more. And uh, I think this is a great uh, way that open source community works, that uh, different people start their own projects and uh, more mature projects can take those ideas and, and make the, the more mature driver even better. So while we are developing the Rust driver, uh, we use uh, different profiling tools and uh, the Rust ecosystem actually makes it very easy to, uh, to run different profilers. And uh, one of the profilers uh, built into Cargo is Cargo Flame Graph. Uh, a utility that cre can create the flame graphs uh, of the execution of the driver or any other tool that you are developing. And this produces uh, such a, a flame graph uh, uh, file. I'm sure you are familiar with that. And the other tool that uh, uh, is mostly for projects based on Tokyo is Tokyo Console that allows you to look into different tasks that are currently, or by task, I mean the asynchronous uh, futures that are happening on the on the Tokyo runtime. You can look at into uh, look into it uh, in real time. You can see how much those tasks take uh, time. And this is another great way to profile uh, Rust applications uh, written with Tokyo. Uh, so now let's move on to the, the final uh, thing of the presentation, which, which are the bindings to the Scylla DB Rust driver. And uh, so let's start with what I mean by bindings. So when we are developing the, the Scylla DB Rust driver and benchmarking it, it was so great and much better than the C++ driver that we had this idea that, oh, how, how we could have this performance of the Rust driver, but still in C++. Uh, for example, if someone has some C++ applications that uh, use some C++ driver. 
So an obvious idea popped up in our mind is to uh, develop a binding, so uh, compatibility uh, that allows you to call the CLADB Rust driver from the C++ code and have uh, great performance. And for us, it uh, uh, greatly reduces the maintenance burden because uh, the bindings uh, project is uh, uh, really smaller and uh, uh, we don't have to maintain two huge drivers. We only have to maintain the Rust driver and the smaller bindings. And uh, by having this core of the, of the driver written in one language, in Rust language, uh, we have fewer bugs as uh, uh, we don't have to test many drivers. We only have to focus uh, really carefully on a single driver, the Rust driver. So the idea of bindings was a really great idea. Uh, so uh, we started the development of bindings uh, with the C++, uh, C++ language. Uh, so we based the bindings API on the original C++ driver. So having the same API. And that means that uh, when you build the C++ bindings, uh, this is just an SO file, SO library that you, that you can actually just uh, replace uh, as is, uh, it is the C++ driver. And as the API is the same, this will just work. And uh, we actually run the original test of the C++ driver by replacing this SO file. And uh, most of the tests, a vast majority of the tests are working out of the box. Uh, the resulting project uh, is uh, really much smaller. Uh, actually, when you look at different drivers, uh, they can have uh, multiple tens of thousands of lines of code, but uh, the bindings project is uh, so much smaller. So uh, that means that uh, it's very easy to maintain. And actually, uh, we saw that uh, this bindings project has uh, better stability and uh, while developing it and while testing it, we had actually fewer problems compared to the original C++ driver. And uh, this is uh, partially what we expected as uh, the Rust core of the driver was really well tested and we are very confident in that. Uh, so maybe as a final thing, uh, this is maybe a very short uh, peek of the, of the driver and, and the bindings. So on the right is the original uh, header declaration of, the, of some function in the C++ driver. And on the left is the implementation that we did in the bindings. So as you can see, uh, this is external C. Uh, this uh, has the no mangle. Uh, defined in this uh, in this function, so this actually will be represented as the same symbol as the original uh, C function. But under the hood, we actually call different uh, different uh, components of the Rust driver. So the uh, user using the bindings is actually uh, from his perspective or her perspective, isn't really aware of that uh, the fact that uh, some other driver is working under the hood. Uh, for them, it's just uh, uh, just the same API, and uh, they don't have to worry about uh, uh, configuring the Rust driver. It's done in the same way as the C++ driver is done by this thin compatibility layer. So that uh, concludes the presentation. So now we can move on to the Q&A phase. Uh, but before we do that, uh, there are a couple of, uh, couple of events that uh, SLADB is organizing. Uh, so uh, next month, uh, we have a, uh, a very nice webinar about building low latency REST applications on SLADB. So this particular webinar will be more hands-on 
uh, you learn more about CDADB, uh, not only uh, uh, the Rust portion, but uh, also how to use CDADB. And actually, I'll be taking part in this uh, webinar. Uh, but apart from that, uh, you can also check out our CDADB University. And uh, later this year, at the end of the year, we are organizing P99Conf. This is a virtual uh, conference that uh, we uh, we have many uh, speakers from across the industry. So this is not a Scylla specific conference. This is really a really a, a broad conference about different aspects of performance. And uh, uh, this is not our first time organizing this conference. And uh, when you visit the website, you can see the presentation from last year, which I really encourage you to check out them. Okay, so let's move on to Q&A uh, phase. And uh, actually I have the, uh, the view of the questions that you have asked us. So uh, maybe let's start with this, uh, this one question. So uh, this one, it's really fun, I think. Uh, so uh, this question is about whether we plan or we have thought about using the Rust uh, language in Scylla DB itself, so the, the core database. And, uh, and actually, uh, I think there are some parallels to the Linux kernel, where the Linux kernel is a huge C project. Uh, of course, in terms of Scylla, it's a C++ project, but uh, Similar to the Linux kernel, we actually are interested in changing uh, some small parts to use the, the Rust language. And uh, actually right now, one small component of Scylla is written in Rust. So uh, we recently uh, introduced a support for user-defined functions that use WebAssembly to run the user-defined uh, function. And uh, this portion of the code that handles the user-defined function is actually written in Rust. So uh, we found out that uh, the uh, particular WebAssembly runtime that we are using, it was much easier and uh, better to, to use the, the Rust language to interface with that. And uh, so this is one small portion of, uh, of the database that, uh, uh, that we actually use the Rust uh, language uh, f4 and uh, actually internally we are experimenting with uh, uh, integrating a rust language and our own cstar framework for c++ and being able to for those two uh, separate lands to coexist and uh, to be able to write more components uh, in rust for Scylla. so I guess this will be an exciting thing to uh, watch how it progresses in the future. Uh, so maybe, maybe this question. Um, I guess it should be visible right now. Uh, so the question is about the load balancing. Is it a single or multiple failover? So uh, in CLADB, you can configure the replication factor of the data. So uh, the default value that we suggest uh, our users to use is replication factor free. So it means that uh, if you have an insert query, this data will be replicated on, onto three different nodes. and uh, uh, so in that case, uh, this will be multiple failover as, uh, uh, as when the query, for example, if you do a select query and two nodes don't uh, answer this query, then the third node will be queried. And we have also, apart from that, we have uh, other uh, policies, other replication policies. So you can have multi-DC policies. So you can specify that some of the nodes are in some uh, data center, like a regional AWS, and uh, you can specify a replication factor in each one of them. So 
uh, CellADBs uh, can really handle uh, cases uh, where uh, an entire data, data, data center goes down. And actually, uh, I think there, there was a really nice blog post about uh, one case of, uh, of a customer that had uh, an entire uh, data center go down and uh, actually the latencies of the database of CellaDB didn't really get worse and uh, the database handled it really well. Uh, so maybe this one is a really great question. So, uh, so the question is about uh, where should I start uh, if I also want to develop a CLADB driver? And as I alluded to in the presentation, actually this is not uh, that a daunting task that it can done be a, it can be done by a small team in a hackathon. So. Uh, so this is, first of all, this is not a daunting task. You should be, should not be scared about it. And uh, my personal recommendation about how to start with that would be, uh, first of all, uh, look into other drivers and how they do the uh, lower level, uh, lower level uh, operations. So I guess the Rust driver is uh, the newest driver. I think this is the, the cleanest driver in terms of the code base. So I would start looking at uh, the Rust driver for inspiration, uh, first of all. Uh, the second thing is uh, reading the documentation on the, the protocol description. And actually, I think you can go really far by just reading the, the documentation, the description of the protocol, and just implementing this protocol. And uh, when you get over that phase, I think that, uh, uh, for example, Sladib University is a great way to learn about those uh, load balancing concepts, for example, that, uh, that are a great component, a really necessary component of uh, writing a driver. So this, this one is... Uh, very short question, but uh, uh, but the Rust driver code is yes, it's open source. So uh, I guess uh, I guess someone uh, will write it on on the chat really soon. Uh, but yes, it's open source and uh, it was started as an open source project. So actually, if you dig down the history of the the Git repository, you can see how how it was developed and uh, how it uh, over three years ago, how how it was started, or the what was what was the first components that we have developed. Uh, so another question is about uh, the efficiency of SillaDB compared to other databases. So. Uh, uh, so I guess uh, my recommendation is to go to the CIDADB website. We have really many benchmarks uh, written about it. Uh, my personal favorite, because I took part in, in that effort, was comparing uh, Cassandra 4 uh, to CIDADB. And uh, we published two blog posts about those, uh, those benchmarks. And uh, actually, we started uh, the first blog post was comparing uh, Cassandra 3 compared to Cassandra 4. So even uh, for people not interested in Scylla, this was a great uh, resource for learning about the performance of the databases. So uh, in our blog, uh, you can read many articles about different uh, performance of the databases like Scylla DBA Cassandra, uh, as well as uh, on our a main website you can see i think it's right right there on the the first page you can see i think the the performance compar comparison of uh, dynamodb how how the cost differs between CLADB and dynamodb uh, as well as other databases
Okay, so I think we are nearing the, the end of the presentation so and uh, the end of the time. So I think I'll, uh, uh, I'll uh, get, uh, uh, um, I'll finish the presentation right now and uh, uh, take it back to the Linux Foundation. Thank you so much, Peter, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.